Good evening and welcome to the LSE. Uh, my name is Tony Travers. Uh, may I welcome you on behalf of the school and in particular on behalf of the British Government LSE, a new initiative to promote and extend research and teaching politics, government and political economy across the institution. Uh, this evening's event has been arranged so as to allow a wider audience to hear firsthand from Phil Grafton, currently chairman of Kroll, a global risk consulting company. He is, of course, better known for having previously been the police commissioner in New York and more recently in Los Angeles. He's in London to talk to the Prime Minister and today given evidence to the Home Affairs Select Committee in Parliament. In particular, he's been asked to address the question of gang culture in Britain, inevitably in the context of the riots that took place in a number of uh, British cities during August. And in addition to London, he's also visiting Manchester and Birmingham while in the UK. Tomorrow, he'll be a lead participant in a Home Office sponsored conference entitled the International Forum on Ending Gang Violence. Now, I think it's fair to say a number of challenges face uh, the government and police in Britain at the moment. The Metropolitan Police, notably, has had a difficult recent period for a number of reasons, including, it must be said, uh, an increasingly awkward relationship with politicians brought about in part, I think, because the Met is the police force that deals with alleged wrongdoing in some of it inside government. But there have been other problems, uh, links to the policing of public events, the News International hacking scandal, and the handling of the August, August riots. And most recently, of course, the government's decision to push through directly elected uh, police and crime commissioners to replace police authorities. A new Metropolitan Police Commissioner, uh, Bernard Hogan Howe, I know Bill's been to see, has recently been appointed at Scotland Yard, and he now faces the question of how to sort out all of these problems, and of course, next year, to manage the Olympic Games. So it's against this background, and most particularly because of his own reputation in American cities, uh, that Bill Bratton addresses us tonight. He will speak for 20 to 25 minutes or so, and we'll then be happy to take questions. He's going to direct uh, this process from here, I think. And afterwards, around 7.45pm, there'll be a reception in the atrium, which is outside of this, the old theatre to the left, or if you're upstairs, downstairs, and to the right. <laughs> Geography. Right, now, William J. Bratton, CBE, honorary CBE, who prefers to be called Bill, is, as I've said, currently Chairman of Kroll. He's a US Army veteran who saw service in Vietnam and who began his police career in Boston in 1970. Today, he's best known for having run two major US police forces in New York and Los Angeles. Crime fell sharply on his watch in both these cities on the basis, first, of community policing, police on the streets, but also as a result of the use of Comstat which applied fine-grained statistical information about criminal activity to allow the rapid redeployment of officers, officers to stop crime before it could occur. And he published an autobiography in 1988, and I noticed flyers for his other book has been handed out outside. He's currently vice chair of the US Homeland Security Advisory Council and a frequent lecturer, writer, and commentator about security, counterterrorism, and law enforcement. This evening, his talk here at the LSE is entitled A More Secure World from Neighbourhoods to Globe. It's my honour and pleasure to welcome Bill Bratton to the London School of Economics and Political Science. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Bratton. Thank you. I'd like to thank the London School of Economics for the opportunity to stand on the stage. Uh, when I was first uh, offered the opportunity, I gladly accepted. And uh, I went when I got into the green room in the back of the stage, uh, I began to wonder. I looked at the wall of photographs of previous speakers. And when you stand on the same stage and behind the same podium, the former President of the United States, two British Prime Ministers, Nelson Mandela, among others, have stood on at this podium, it is uh, somewhat intimidating. And hopefully that uh, I'll be up to the standards that they set in their prior speeches to you. This evening I want to talk to you about uh, the profession of policing, something that I have spent most of my adult life in, in some respects uh, helping to shape the direction of policing in my country, 
My comments will be from the perspective of an American dealing with the issues in America, but I'll be very happy, particularly in the question and answer period, to speak to so much of what's happening in your country today. And what is happening in your country today is nothing short of revolutionary. To be here in London where democratic policing first began back in the early 1800s, Sir Robert Peel, nine principles of policing that are attributed to him, which are the foundation of democratic policing. To be in this city speaking on this issue at this particular time is for me uh, a very exciting opportunity. And to be asked to speak to it as an advisor, to be asked to speak to it as someone with an opinion is very important to me. Because I am known for my willingness to speak on the issue and to speak candidly. So tonight's discussion with you is my impression, my opinions, my thoughts about professional policing, both in my country and some of the issues that you're dealing with in yours. When I talk about a revolution, if you think about what is happening in your country at this moment, that the system of policing that has been in existence for many, many years, you are intending now, next November, to change that significantly in this country. We have 43 police agencies. Currently, the Met is already moving in this direction. And next November 12th, that you will have the opportunity to elect police commissioners who will have direct control and influence over the British chief constables and the 42 other police departments in your country. That is a very significant revolutionary change in the way you have done business. In many respects, you are removing the monolithic control and influence from the Home Office, from the national government, and devolving it to the local level. It is compared with the American experience. It is oftentimes talked about as being modeled after the American experience. I would like to join my comments to uh, argue against that simple explanation because in America, we have 17,000 police departments, and I don't think any two of them are alike in terms of how they are directed, how they are controlled, versus what you are proposing is going to be a generic uh, recipe for your issues. But in terms of policing, the profession that I'm so proud to have been part of over 40 years and now basically still get to spend a great deal of my time interacting with, as I have these last several days in London, let me speak to you from the perspective of the love I have for that profession and the importance of it in our democracy. In our democracy, the first obligation of government, whether it be here in the British Isles or in my country, the United States, the first obligation of government is public safety. It is spoken to in our Constitution. It is the one guarantee that we have. And in democracies, the idea of rule of law, the idea of public safety, is the platform upon which all the other benefits of our society, our democratic way of life, are in fact built. The columns of welfare, the columns of health, the column of education, the column of free speech. If that platform that those columns are erected upon is shaky or wavering, then those columns will also waver. So the obligation of government to ensure public safety is one that has to be held in the highest regard and tampered with only reluctantly about a necessity. Your government has chosen, as it has looked at the last number of years in your country, to make a change, to make a change to ensure that the police leadership in your country, in the democracy, is instead of looking up to the national government for guidance and leadership, is instead focusing its energy and attention back down to the local level local priorities, local needs, local leadership. That's a process I'm very familiar with in my country because that's basically the way our system works. With a local police chief, a police commissioner, a police superintendent, I've had all three of those titles, works for and reports to usually an elected political official. And that's the way it always has been in the United States. And by and large, it has worked pretty well for us it will be very interesting to see, as you move toward that, how it works for you. You will effectively have 43 experiments underway all at the same time. Because I can guarantee that in those 43 communities, while there is a generic design to the system, 
you're going to have 86 different personalities, 43 commissioners and 43 chief constables. And so how they eventually decide to work together within the framework of the language that's being designed for them will be a very interesting experiment to behold. I come in my country, the system is more established. And I'd like to speak to my country's experience, which is mirrored very much by yours in terms of what has happened in policing over the 40 years that I have been associated with policing. My beginning in 1970 as a Boston police officer was the culmination of a desire, a childhood desire, to be a police officer, influenced in significant ways by the television of the 1950s, Dragnet, Bad 714, 1 out of 12, and many of the books that I had read and many of the movies I had seen. So at age 23, coming back from Vietnam, serving three years in the US military, I fulfilled my lifelong dream to become a Boston police officer. I came into policing at a profound time in our history, coming out of the social disturbances of the 60s, the anti-war movement against the war in Vietnam, the civil rights movement, the involvement of our college students for the first time in large numbers trying to reshape the society they were growing up in and being educated in. And I came into a policing profession that uh, was not a profession in any way, shape, or form as we understand it to be. The Boston Police Department I joined in 1970 was a corrupt, brutal, gracious, inefficient, incompetent organization. And one that, while I had longed to become a part of it, very quickly I learned and felt that this was not for me. But fortunately, and some of my remarks tonight will focus on the issue of leadership. Fortunately, a new leader joined the Boston Police Department, an elected mayor, understanding that his reelection was in difficulty because of the condition of the police department and the dissatisfaction with it, appointed an outsider, brought in a police chief from outside the Boston Police Department, who began to do a phenomenal turnaround in that organization. To the extent that in 1975, as a 27-year-old young man in the Boston Police Department who decided to stay because I was excited by the changes he was bringing. He was getting rid of the corrupt police officers. He was bringing in outsiders to reform our education and our training. That he was re-engineering through his leadership skills the Boston Police Department and created a department that was going to be much more accountable to the public and to the political leadership that had appointed him. His name, Bob DeGrazio. He is uh, still, for me, uh, a significant role model in my life because he changed my life. In 1975, I was promoted to the rank of sergeant, and I was the youngest sergeant ever in the history of the Boston Police Department, largely because of the changes he made in the promotion system that prior to that time gave almost 75% of the grade in a promotion exam to seniority. So that the average age of the size of the Boston Police Department was around 55 to 56. I was not interested in waiting 30 years for my first promotion. <laughs> Fortunately, I did not have to wait that long. But I also had the opportunity to interact with some of the advisors he had brought in from outside the policing profession. Whiz kids, they were called. Usually uh, young men, there were five of them in their late 20s, early 30s, all college educated, all progressive, all liberal, and they were poison to the leadership of the Washington Police Department. And when the Grazia finally got rid of that legacy of poor leadership and began to bring up others within the ranks, they responded to some of the new ideas that those young men were bringing into the Washington Police Department. And one of them, Robert Wasserman, who has uh, to this day remained one of my closest friends, mentors, and advisors. Robert Wasserman was a great admirer of the British police services. He had spent time here, and back in the 1970s, uh, that uh, uh, the progressiveness of your organization was beginning to take hold, some of the reputation that it was beginning to develop around the world. It was an organization also like the American police forces dealing with issues of concern back in that era but it was still deemed to be an organization that was forward-leaning. And the success that I eventually achieved was in many respects due to the adoption of a British police patrol style. Bob Washington exposed me first day in the office of the police commissioner to a book called Policing a Free Society by Herman Goldstein, one of the leading academics in my country. The second thing he exposed me to was a patrol plan that the British police at that time followed, 
in which there were two levels of police service delivered to the community, apart from the British Bobby walking the beat. There was a two officer rapid response car to deal with significant crimes and emergencies in progress. And then there was a single officer patrol. And that officer was a service officer who was going to stay within the confines of the geographic area, like the original Bobby uh, of Sir Robert Peel of the neighborhood, knowing the neighborhood, the neighborhood knowing and recognizing him or her. And the rapid response cars would tend to cover a much larger area, probably have less interaction with the public and be less known to them. I adopted that model and was given the assignment in Boston of taking our most difficult policing district, which was struggling through an urban change that was occurring. The district would encompass uh, many of the universities, Boston University, Emerson University, Wentworth University, of our city. It also encompassed many of the sports complexes, Fenway Park, many of our museums, Symphony Hall, First Church of Christ Scientists, their main church. But it was suffering urban decline, high crime rates, incredible amounts of social decay, graffiti, aggressive begging, uh, drug dealing on corners, prostitution. This in one of the most significant areas of the city for visitors, tourists, for kids going to school from outside the state, it was in decline. That group of institutions came together and formed the Boston Fenway Program and convinced the Boston Police Department to assign a resource, me, to work with them on designing a new police plan to deal with crime in their area. I was a whiz kid in those days. I was good at designing the computer systems, the statistics. You give me a, a, a problem, I would solve it for you, and I design systems to work on that problem. It was the advent of computerization and policing, and I developed the standard beat plan, and I can tell you how long it took us on average to get to a call, how long it took us to clear the call. And I was armed with, at these community meetings that I began to develop. And it was the first time in the Boston Police Department that they went to the community to hear from the community, what are your issues concerning? And I had it all, the rapes, the murders, the robberies, the response time statistics. What I had with me was how the Boston Police Department was responding to citizen calls for service, to citizen concerns as we, the police, thought they were. The era of policing that we had entered in the 70s and the 80s, and indeed it still continues to this day in many American police departments, was called the professional era, but it was focused largely on the issue of responding to crime. Because as part of the societal changes coming out of the 60s and 70s, we the police in my country, and indeed I think the same experience happened in yours, we were told that we really could not do anything about what we thought to be the causes of crime, racism, poverty, the economy, demographics, rather that we should increase our professionalization, do much better at developing science, do much better at developing systems, do much better at responding to crime. And that would affect crime by basically after the fact policing. So that's how we designed our response to crime. And I was an expert at it. As I began to go to these community meetings, however, and I would be up there with my charts and I'd be up there explaining in terms of how we were responding to the concerns, when I opened it up to question and answers, they didn't want to talk about the rapes and murders that were occurring in the neighborhood, the burglaries, because they were unaware of most of those things. But what they wanted to talk about, and this was the revela revelation for me that changed my life in many respects eventually through my uh, practices and many others in America who embraced the same concept. They were talking with us about their concerns about broken windows, the minor things that we the police were not paying any attention to, such as prostitution, such as the graffiti, such as the aggressive begging, the abandoned cars who were never never removed the neighborhood, the gang on the corner. We, the police, because we were not partnering with the community, we were trying to tell the community what they needed to hear. I learned very early on in my career about the importance of listening to the community and working with the community. Effectively, I had the opportunity in the 1970s to be exposed to the beginnings of a concept, a philosophy of policing, that finally in the 1990s took hold in my country. and something that you're well aware of in your country. And that concept of policing is called community policing. And community policing was very different than the professional model of measuring our success by responding to crime. Instead with community policing, we were going to measure our success 
And Sir Robert Peel measured his success in the 1820s, the 1840s in your city by our ability to prevent crime, by our willingness to be held accountable for crime. If you think of it, in the 70s and 80s in my country, we were excused from any responsibility for crime because society felt that crime was caused by societal issues that society had to figure out for itself and the police had no role in that. We had it wrong. Crime is caused by individuals. It's caused by groups of individuals. You certainly recently had that experience during your riots. And that is where the police come in, in fulfilling that obligation of democracy. The first auto of democracy is to ensure the public safety. We are the ones empowered with a tremendous power to use force, to use deadly force, to control behavior of those who refuse to obey the law, either intentionally or sometimes emotionally, and during emotional distress or sometimes under the influence, whether it be drugs or alcohol. The challenge for us in policing is to ensure that we do it lawfully, that we don't break the law to enforce the law, to ensure that we do it compassionately, that we are dealing with human beings no matter how bad they are, that we cannot be brutal, that we cannot be callous, we cannot be racist in our actions. And thirdly, the idea is that we need to do it consistently, to not police differently in poor neighborhoods from rich neighborhoods, or to deprive certain neighborhoods of services because of circumstances in those neighborhoods. So as we moved into the 70s and 80s in my country, we began to understand as crime was exploding, gun violence, drug-related violence, domestic violence, drug-induced and influenced violence, that that old model of responding to police, in which we had no accountability, because society had excused us from prevention of crime, myself and many other police leaders, likely, and many academics and some politicians, including Giuliani, uh, President Bill Clinton, in the 90s, we came to understand that there needed to be a different way of policing. And that was community policing, with its emphasis on partnership, problem solving, and prevention. Everything old is new again. And we came back to what Sir Robert Peel and his nine principles of policing had espoused in the 1840s, that we are the police and the people are us, and we need to work together. Those partnerships in the 1990s also were shaped by a lot of creativity in the sense of dealing with crime, and I'll speak in a moment to that system, really shaped American policing success in the 90s that continues to this day, even as we, like yourself, are dealing with significant, tremendous pressures from the recession that we are involved in, the economic slowdown and churn down, and the malaise that is afflicting both your country and my country about the future, about where are we going and how do we move forward after being pushed back on our heels for so long. But in the 90s, it was a special time. My country invested in its police. It invested in its first obligation for public safety. 100,000 new police funded by the federal government. New ideas, new prisons, new training programs, new efforts to try and deal with our issues, our societal issues. And we began to succeed, a reduction of 40% in the overall violent crime rate and a reduction of 30% in the overall crime rate. Cities such as New York, which I was privileged to serve first as chief of the transit police and then subsequently as police commissioner, Mayor Giuliani's first police commissioner, we took the combination of problem solving policing, the idea of working with the community and understanding that the community is not this monolithic entity. The community is made up of many neighborhoods many communities. Your city is broken into 32 boroughs, and each of those boroughs has many neighborhoods within it. Each of those 32 boroughs has a different set of priorities and concerns that they want the police to focus on. Through community policing, we were able to work with the individual neighborhoods, the individual political leaders, and in fact, the devolution of responsibility that you were moving toward is intended to ensure that police are in a position to not have to look above for guidance, but rather to look below into the sides, left and right, with the communities that they are policing to ensure that we are responding to their particular priorities, needs, and concerns. And that was the great turnaround in my country and in your country also, because you began, some of your police leaders began to embrace this idea that we had to basically do something different than we have been doing. And it worked, and it continues to work. And the importance of those changes in the 1990s particularly 
embracing a concept of uh, policing, an engine that drives American policing, CompStep, system developed in New York, a system that was focused on the idea if crime was to be the number one concern of police, we needed to know as much about it as possible. We needed to know when it was occurring, who was doing it, how were they doing it. We needed to have timely, accurate intelligence. We needed to, every day, to the best of our ability, be tracking crime and where it was evolving, where it was growing, where patterns and trends were developing. We needed to develop response capabilities, working with community to rapidly respond to those growing dots on the map. We used the term cops on the dots. As the dots began to expand, we wanted to put cops on those dots with effective tactics that would eventually reduce that patent, eliminate that particular crime problem. But then we did not go away. There was a fourth element to that. And that was relentless follow-up, that we effectively kept going back to make sure it wasn't coming back. CompStat, while it was celebrated as this new uh, engine, if you will, driving American policing, really there's nothing new about it. We dealt with it during World War II. 1939, 1940, the Battle of Britain when New York country stood alone against the powers of fascism. You were truly alone at that time. And it was thought that you were going to go under. You had a great leader, Winston Churchill, who when asked at the end of the war about how was it that you were able to basically keep your country together and to keep the forces of uh, the Nazis and uh, the, the Axis from overwhelming you until basically allies such as America began to come to work with you to fight that axis. And he gave a speech, a commencement speech, and in sum he said, never give in, never give in, never give in. The idea that he resisted those forces of tyranny. But he also benefited uh, at the early stage of the war when you were in the most peril with the uh, blitz destroying your city, whole areas going up in flames at night. Fortunately, what you had was radar in its infancy. But as those German bombers came from bases all over Europe, France, Holland, Belgium, with radar, you had timely, accurate intelligence. As primitive as it was, you were able to detect where they were coming from and where they were going to as they began to assemble. Rapid response, the 600 plus British Spitfires, all you had was 600 of them, but you were able to force multiply them because with your rapid response, you were able to send all 600 toward where the Germans were coming. Effective tactics. You've all seen those movies where at the end of the battle, the pilot comes down into the hut, and he has his cup of tea, and he sits there and he gets debriefed. The idea behind that was to learn what happened up there today. What new tactic were the Germans employing? What did you use to basically shoot down their bombs? And so that idea of CompStat, timely active intelligence, rapid response, the use of your planes to put them on the dots, effective tactics, and relentless follow-up. The idea of the next day going up and doing it all over again, but learning from the previous day's experience. Effectively, what won the war against crime, or began to reverse the war against crime that we were losing in the United States, was effectively how you began to win your war here in the 1930s. So much as I learned a lot of my policing from police police services, uh, initiatives in the 1970s, a lot of uh, what we brought into the fight against crime in New York City was the work of a young man, Jack Maple. Jack Maple was a transit police lieutenant, but he was the smartest person that ever lived on the issue of crime. And I was fortunate I ran across him in the transit police, and from him I learned so much. And together, our collaboration, and I emphasize that word collaboration because when we talk about partnership, it really is about collaboration. Partnership with community, in policing, it was partnership not only within the organization, because organizations oftentimes do not work together, they don't collaborate together, they exist in their silos. What we brought about with CompStat was that collaboration within the organization that allowed us to collaborate even more effectively with our political leadership, with our individual communities, whether they're rich or poor, white or black, that we're able to prioritize our assignments of resources, the cops that we had, to the issues that were most concerning to the public. So in the 90s, we began to win. And then 9-11 occurred. And we talked earlier about the title of this talk, the idea of moving down into the neighborhood level. 9-11 occurred, and it impacted certainly our country, my country, your country. We're still engaged, you and I, our countries in the war. 
in Afghanistan, coming out of Iraq, finally, we were finally bucking our forces out of Iraq. But the world changed for us. The world that you would live with for 30 years with the IRA terrorism, but now that America was now being exposed to for the first time. And we have a saying in our country that has emanated from that period of time that homeland security is really about hometown security. The idea that even as we had addressed our crime problem in the 1990s, by collaboration between community and police at the neighborhood level, not at the city level, or the state level, or the national level, the successes were because the collaboration was at the local level. That even in dealing with the new crime, the new fear, terrorism, we were going to deal with that in the same way. We were going to need the 300 million Americans to work with the approximately 800,000 police officers and two and a half million security officers in our country to protect our borders from within. We could not rely on the FBI and the CIA who were charged with basically dealing internationally with terrorism. Like dealing with the crime problem, it was going to have to be done at the local level. And it has been done. Since 9 11, the attacks that have been detected in my country, the approximately 100 attempts to commit terrorist acts in the United States since 9 11, almost three quarters of them have been detected and deterred by local police and local community residents who are being asked to see something, say something. Once again, the collaboration between community at the local level with local police in partnership, working in my case, in my country, with my government, with the federal and state agencies, that, that unity of purpose, that unity of sharing, that unity of collaboration is what's basically keeping my country safe from a new fear. In summary, we are living in extraordinarily interesting times. They, to quote Charles Dickens uh, from his book, The Tale of Two Cities, they were the best of times, the worst, they were the worst of times. We are effectively in the best of times and the worst of times right now. The best of times that we have learned that there are many things that can impact on the crime problem. And that the police alone are not the solution to that crime problem. No matter how effective we get, no matter how many CompStat type systems we have, we cannot arrest our way out of the crime problem or the gang problem or any of the issues. We need collaboration with the communities that we police and that we serve. We need collaboration with our political leadership. So the best of times in that we have learned how, like a doctor, to deal with the many different patients. You have 43 different uh, communities that you have chief constables and will soon have elected police commissioners. It's like a doctor with 43 different patients. No one of them is exactly the same as another. So you want to have an ability to look at that patient and make a determination what are the medicines that are going to be necessary to deal with that patient's issues. And that's where the skills of your chief constable, the skills of your new police commissioner, the skills of your national government, and your skills to collaborate together, to identify what are the priorities at a time of lessened resources. What is going to have to happen to make you feel safe, to feel that there is less disorder, that there is less fear, that there is less crime. A partnership with limited resources that there is a common ground that you can all stand on. And that is going to be the challenge going forward. The best of times. At the other hand, on the other hand, it might be argued that it's the worst of time because of the economic circumstances our two countries find themselves in. Certainly, the clear intent moving forward here in Britain to uh, deal directly with your budgetary issues, the idea, the plans that are being made to ensure that the issues of lack of resources are spread across all of the government agencies so that the idea is that collaboration is going to be more essential than ever. The idea that in the worst of times, the benefit of that, coming out of that crisis, crisis creates challenges. And the challenges for your country, and the challenges for mine as police services and government services and government employees are being reduced significantly in state after state, city after city. Out of that forces a new awareness, a, a taking a look at what we've been doing, taking a look at what works, what's essential to keep it working, and what might be excess, what might in fact be put off to the side that we can no longer afford. I am an optimist when it comes to the issue of policing. 
I had been in good times and in bad times. In 1980, I had to lay off 25% of the Boston police force. I laid off every police officer hired in the Boston Police Department since 1970, including all officers in my class. I was excluded because I was the superintendent of the police. 25% of the 500 officers in the space of three months, we closed half the police stations in the city of Boston. But in dealing with that crisis, we came through it because we worked in partnership, government, neighborhoods, to deal with the issue. I've also worked in the best of times, New York City, where I had 38,000 police officers, more than you have in London. And you are a larger city with a larger population. But I had 38,000 officers so I could put cops on the dots everywhere, all at the same time. And in two years, the New York miracle had occurred, crime had gone down. In Los Angeles, it took seven years to have a similar dramatic decline in crime and gang crime in that city, because they only had 9,000 police officers. To have the equivalent of what I had in New York, I would have needed 18,000. But they only had 9,000. It took longer. But in taking longer, what also happened in Los Angeles was something that didn't happen in those first two years in New York. We really had to develop more extraordinary relationships with our communities. And in the case of Los Angeles, the black community in the Los Angeles Police Department had been at war for 50 years. The policy of the Los Angeles Police Department was arrest, arrest, arrest. The official motto of the department was to protect and to serve. The unofficial motto was hook them and book them, handcuff them and put them in jail. And that was the principal strategy of the LAPD. And basically, most of it was directed toward the city's minority population. You cannot arrest your way out of the crime problem. We now clearly understand that. The future in Los Angeles, the future in New York, the future in America, and the future in your country is not in handcuffs. I've had the opportunity over the last several days to be briefed on gang initiatives that are underway in some of your principal cities. I'll be in Birmingham tomorrow, as in Manchester yesterday, and today I spent the day with the Met. There is a lot of exciting activity underway in your country at this moment as it relates to the issue of fear that is growing about the issue of gangs. Good news for you is that your gang problem is still in its birthing stage, 10, 15 years old, versus in Los Angeles, it's almost 100 years old for the Latino gangs and almost 60 years old for our black gangs. You have the ability, in partnership, and the efforts I've been briefed on a partnership between your national children's agencies, your national probation agencies, and your local police, that they are working together and working with communities, community policing so that there is an ability to deal with the worst of times at the moment, because your gang problem is the worst it's been. But it can become the best of times, as it did in Los Angeles, in the sense that uh, the fortunate time that I had in Los Angeles, gang crime and gang murders were reduced by almost 60% in those seven years, overall gang crime by almost 39%. Because of that partnership the LAPD began to engage in consistently and compassionately. So that the dismal relationship that resulted in two of the worst race riots in American history in Los Angeles, that I had the privilege of when I left Los Angeles, that more than two thirds of blacks and Latino citizens in that city were reporting that they had confidence in the Los Angeles Police Department. It can happen, but it requires leadership that is willing to be held accountable, leadership that is willing to partner with community, with government, Leadership is willing to understand that it doesn't have all the answers. Leadership that understands the more partners there are, the more ideas to deal with. Gandhi, the great Indian leader, the great civil rights leader, had in the term, and I paraphrase it, to create change, you must become the change. Moving forward in your country, moving forward in my country, is going to require great changes. You have already clearly indicated that through your political leadership that you want change in your police services. Not going to be easy, but the more of you that embrace it, the more of you that accept the challenge, accept that crises is going to create opportunity, then the quicker those changes will occur and the more comprehensive they will be. The profession I am so proud of is an essential part of change in a democracy. We need to do it constitutionally, compassionately, consistently. We need to do it with you, not to you. 
I believe we have, in fact, blended the best of times and the worst of times. So as I look forward, whether it's in my country or in your country, as I'm now spending time here again, I'm very optimistic that the changes that you are bringing about in the way you are policed, the way you want to be policed, are going to, in the long run, prove very beneficial to you in your country. I was very pleased the creativity, the imagination, the partnership I've been seeing between your police services and the other agencies of government and the community that I've seen over the last several days. It reminds me so much of what I experienced personally in New York and Los Angeles during my time as chief of police. In closing, remembrance of you get what you pay for. With your scarce public dollars, the prioritization on public safety is absolutely essential. But public safety, traditionally thought of as the police and criminal justice system, is not the end all because they cannot, on their own, deal with the issue of your safety. It requires collaboration. It requires partnership. It requires inclusion. And most importantly, it requires transparency. The idea, the willingness to be able to explain, be willing to explain why we're doing it, how we're doing it, when we're doing it, and for who we're doing it. The idea that transparency has to be existing in all of these efforts, whether it be traditional policing or terrorism or gang issues. That is the way forward. It's going to require leadership. It's not going to be easy. It's going to require partnership. But ultimately, it is the way to go. I've experienced it for 40 years, and I intend to stay involved with it, I hope, for many more years to come. And I hope as the opportunities come to visit your country, and I love this country, I love this city, I love what you represent, and certainly the profession I'm so proud to be part of, so much of the history of that profession began here and continues here. And I'm so thankful to have been offered the opportunity to participate in the changes that are going to occur in the months and years ahead to be able to comment on it. And I thank the London School of Economics for the opportunity tonight to share with you my feelings, my vision, my thoughts about where you are, where you're going, and how to get there. Thank you. yourself as an advisor. Um, in what capacity are you an advisor to the British government? You're an advisor to the Prime Minister, to the Home Secretary. It's a word that's been rather in our headlines the last few days. So we're a bit suspicious about the word advisor. Um, it, it, how formal is this role? Is it a paid role? Is it a defined role? Uh, I think a lot of us would like to know exactly what do you, there's rumour that the Home Secretary did not want you as a Metropolitan Police Commissioner because you were an outsider and that the uh, Prime Minister gave way. What exactly is your role here in you. this country, and actually as an addendum, where do you think it's gone wrong with the Metropolitan Police? Because for the last three years since the shooting of John Charles Menezes, it's been the worst of times for Metropolitan Police. Let me seek to clarify that so much uh, that has been discussed in the British media, uh, uh, some of it correct, a lot of it incorrect. Yeah. Uh, my capacity at this juncture, this trip, here this week, as I have been asked by the British Home Secretary in her office to participate in a gang conference that will be held on Thursday, an international gang conference with approximately 24 other police officials, academics, researchers from a number of countries that are experiencing gang issues. So I am one of those invited guests who will participate. I've also been asked, because they were aware I was coming into the country on uh, business with my company, if I would be willing to spend some additional time visiting and being briefed uh, on initiatives that are underway in your country to deal with the gang issue. So yesterday, Manchester, today with Scotland Yard, and tomorrow in Birmingham. It is an unpaid position, something that I and my company uh, are willing to provide pro bono. That, uh, and something that I feel very privileged to have been invited to participate in. Uh, I am not a special advisor of any sort to the Prime Minister. 
my conversations with him were really his thanking me for the willingness to participate in uh, this conference. Um, so that's pretty much the extent of my involvement with the uh, British government in terms of as it relates to this singular issue. I'm not coming in as a crime czar, I'm not accepting a position with the British government that uh, I'm not planning to run for a police commission in any one of your 42 uh, uh, communities over here. Uh, I'm quite proud to be an American and very happy to visit your country, but I, I, I like living in New York. <laughs> and, uh, so that's where I intend tend to stay. Uh, but I, I really do feel privileged to be asked to uh, throw my two cents into the discussion, and uh, I'm very happy to do that. Uh, one and two, the young lady to the left, and then the gentleman to her left. Yes, please. Thanks very much. I'd like to, you mentioned that we're going to have uh, 43 different experiments in this country shortly as a result of the appointment of um, police commissioners. Um, if it's politic for you to do so, could you tell us something about the relationship between yourself and the mayors um, in the two jurisdictions where you worked, uh, principally um, LAPD and uh, NYPD? Oh, sure. uh, when I talk about the differences in American policing, and this system is supposedly modeled after the American system, the idea of local control of the police, local influence. In America, there are 17,000 police departments. I've worked in six different police agencies in America. And um, in New York City, I've worked uh, for Mayor Giuliani. I reported as the civilian police commissioner to the elected mayor. I was a direct report to him. As the civilian police commissioner, I was totally responsible for the operations of the New York City Police Department. Hiring, discipline, personnel, it all came under me. I was appointed by the mayor and could be removed at any time by the mayor. In the city of Los Angeles, where I was the police chief, I was a sworn police officer. I wore a uniform, a badge, a gun, and I reported to a board of police commissioners, five police commissioners, all appointed by the mayor of the city of Los Angeles. I was also a direct report to the mayor, in addition to reporting to the police commission. The police commission had an inspector general to review a lot of the policy issues that the police commission had control over. As police chief, I was responsible for the operations of the department, for the discipline, for the assignment of personnel, and in no instance could the police commission or mayor interfere with that operational control. Their role was really policy guidance as well as assistance in budgetary matters. In the city of Boston, when I was police commissioner in Boston, I was a direct report as a civilian police commissioner to the elected mayor of the city of Boston, similar to my uh, uh, responsibility in New York. So the system in America is uh, it's really kind of a hodgepodge that uh, unlike the consistency that you will have in your system, when I talk about 43 experiments, effectively you have 43 experiments currently going on anyway in this country. What the Met is doing about their gang issue, I'd be willing to bet is probably very different than what some of the other 42 uh, areas in your country are doing about the gang issue. Some areas are willing to admit they have a gang problem. Others will not admit they have a gang problem because they feel it would deter business Return investment. So you already have 43 experiments underway, but you're now going to add a new element, which is the effectively the local civilian control over certain aspects of the chief constable's operation. But the operational control of the department, if I understand it correctly, will still rest with that chief constable. It'll be a very interesting and indeed a very exciting time uh, for for this country. And, because out of that, uh, I think will come many, many great ideas that, uh, and uh, different ways of addressing uh, the challenge that you're, that you're facing, the budget issues that you're facing here. Mm -hmm. uh, the to um, I was just wondering whether you, you'd like to comment about the impact of social media on policing. You talk quite a lot about your ability to get spots on the dots in both New York and LA. And that's traditionally been one of the advantages that technology has given the police. With kind of mass consumer uh, social media, perhaps some of the bad guys are getting that as well. And I was just wondering whether you think that's going to be, whether that's just ephemeral or it's going to be a, a genuine challenge moving forward. 
the social media phenomenon is both a good news story and a bad news story, both from a law enforcement perspective. Uh, it's still a, a growing and emerging phenomenon. I was asked in Parliament today my position about the idea of potentially during disturbances, such as you just experienced, about the capability of shutting down the social media networks, the Blackberries, the Facebooks, and all the other things that are out there. And I advise caution on that uh, in the idea that having lived in New York City on 9-11, uh, when I was not able to contact my wife, she was not able to contact me, I was never not able to contact friends in the World Trade Center area, and certainly in my case, many colleagues in the New York City Police Department, all the phones went down because basically they had been demolished the systems that supported them, and then the overuse. That in times of emergency, particularly with the lack of pay phones that now exist, you're going to want to, the good people, not the rioters, but the good people, you're going to want to find out how's your family, how's your children, how are your friends. You're also going to want to rely on the police who can basically reach out to you in many communities now. They, they have developed networks that we can use, networks to advise you to stay out of this area. There's an event going on here. Uh, so it's something that you need to look at very carefully. There is no quick or simple answer to this issue. Also, from the good news standpoint, that from an evidentiary standpoint for policing, uh, the crazy stuff that people put on that social media, uh, in terms of, I can't tell you the number of gangbangs we arrested with all their crazy signs and posing with their guns, <laughs> what better evidence to present in court? <laughs> so that uh, it provides for the police who have access to that, because not much of it's in the public domain, that uh, it, it makes our workload easier. On the other hand, the good and the bad, it makes it more difficult because there's so much of it out there. And uh, so we are in policing, they are feeling their way along, the media is feeling its way along, but it's something that you're going to have to uh, uh, deal with carefully. There are no quick fixes to that issue. Here in the air, please. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I used to close my store in Gramercy Park, a wine store, and I'd be walking the streets of the 19th between 2 and 3 in the morning. I always felt safe, and it wasn't until I looked at the figures today that I realised what an achievement had been made by uh, Inspector Whelan and Inspector Murta during the period I was there. What, what, period of time, what period of time was that, please? Um, it was the 11 years till 2005. Okay. Um, robberies in 1990 were 1,904. Last year the figure was 143. Burglaries in 1990 were 3,695. And last year, 233. Was that entirely down to the community involvement policy, or was there something special, something extra, which perhaps we ought to know? It was all about what I talked about, the idea of collaboration. Police effectively developing uh, systems to accept responsibility and accountability of doing something about the crime problem. To basically expand on those numbers, in New York City, worst crime year in New York City and in America was 1990. I think in your country, similarly that year, if you take a look at it around that time, was probably your worst crime year, uh, certainly here in London. But in uh, 1990, 700,000 reported serious crimes in the city of New York, including 2,243 murders. Almost six or 7,000 people shot on the streets of New York in that city at that time, seven and a half million people. In addition to that were all those broken windows. The city was awful in terms of its appearance, its sense of, of safety. You, might not have picked up on it as much on it where you were living and working, but I'm sure you remember the aggressive beggars and the, the filth and the, uh, the general sense of graffiti everywhere. Uh, the city was a mess and it was going down for the count. And uh, what turned it around was effectively a city that finally said it had had enough. It was a very, a new, very famous New York Post cover story directed at the mayor at that time, Dave Dinkins. Dave, do something. The city was, city was dying. And what he did, he returned to the first obligation of government, which was public safety. He was able to move a tax bill through to hire 7,000 more police officers. 
increase the size of the then three police forces in the city, transit, housing, and city police, from 31,000 to 38,000. Unfortunately for him, he didn't hire them fast enough and he lost the next election to Rudy Giuliani. Fortunately for me, I came through the door and within a month of my being sworn in as police commissioner, I was basically graduating the first class of 2,400 additional police officers. I was in a position to put hundreds more police officers on the docks. And so in two years, the first year crime went down 12%, second year went down 15%. It has gone down every year since. It began in the subways when I was chief of police there. It went down 20 some odd percent in two years I was there. New York this year will report about 130 or 140,000 major crimes. Auto theft is down 95%. Murders are down 80 some odd percent. It is the safest live city in America, and in many respects, one of the safest live cities in the world. But it was not just the police and the systems we adopted, it was the partnership with the community, the embrace of listening to the community, community councils, community activism. It was working with the federal government, which in 1995 passed the Omnibus Crime Bill, which poured billions of dollars into the issue of crime in our country to take back our, our streets. And so that's why I reported really the 40% overall reduction in violent crime, 30% reduction in the United States. New York did even better than that. Using many of the same systems in Los Angeles, during my seven years in Los Angeles, overall crime in that city went down by almost as much. And the collaboration with the community was even more extensive in LA to the extent that we also, while reducing crime here in disorder, we reduced racial tension. Something we did not do as effectively in New York. But from my perspective, my most satisfactory time was LA because that other intractable, seemingly intractable problem that couldn't be fixed in the United States, the issue of race relations, much the same as police in the flashpoint has just occurred in your riot for basically the acceleration of racial tension through our actions, whether justified or not, that we, that we more so than any other element of society, can be the cutting edge for improving race relations if we police constitutionally, compassionately, consistently, if we police in a way that Sir Robert Peel emphasized his nine principles of policing. In LA, I believe we began to do that. And what I watched in terms of the briefings I've been getting about dealing with your gang issues, which unfortunately so many of them involve minority use in this country, that if it's done in a correct way, we can also deal not only with the issues of crime and violence and fear, but we can also reduce the racial tensions as your country, like my country, becomes much more significantly uh, a population of, of many people from all over the world. Your society, the American society, basically the future of the world, the idea that we are the experiment. Can we all get along with each other? And essential to that is going to be the police. Uh, I think I had a commitment to a couple of people, not to be ignoring you up there. In America, we call you the peanut gallery, you know, how do you need a uh, television show? <laughs> <laughs> have any well, peanuts up there? <laughs> yes, uh, how are you doing? <laughs> um, I'm doing fine, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Losing my voice, but other than that, I'm fine. It's a bit hard to But I was very interested in what you said about collaboration. I mean, you have worked on, on both sides of being a public uh, authority and also a private company, and uh, as you've been explaining, You've also been working actively as the head of a private company, Cole, uh, working with public authorities in this country. So I was wondering, could you describe the benefits of the relationship between a private company like Kroll and public authorities like the police or the military? How should collaboration work? What are the benefits? It works in many ways that uh, in New York City, in the late 1980s, the gentleman from the 19th precinct will probably attest to this. The city was a mess. Uh, the government of the city was not doing a good job with crime, <coughs> cleanliness, with upkeep. And at that time, businesses in New York, they were very dependent on tourism, on business investment, created a concept called business improvement districts, bids. So in the Grand Central Terminal area, that hub of thousands of people coming in by train and subway every day. 
The bids focused on three things. On safety, they hired private security officers to provide visibility and enforcement of some of the minor broken windows types of uh, issues. They focused on cleanliness, sweeping the streets, getting rid of the graffiti, painting the light poles. And they focused on street aesthetics, like street furniture. You could spot the business improvement district because the first thing they did was to improve street lighting. So as you're going down the very, New York is a very dark city. And as you go down the, the very dark streets, you see all of a sudden that you're coming into this oasis of light. And when you came in, not only was it lit well, it was clean. It was not only graffiti that was affecting the rest of the city. I would argue that those business improvement districts, that collaboration between government that authorized the business improvement districts to collect an extra tariff from the businesses in that area for those services, that collaborated with the police, <coughs> because the police work closely with the private security forces, that that business public partnership saved New York City. It kept it afloat until the 1990s when new police were hired, new concepts of community policing, Comstep came into being. So you had the Grand Central Partnership, you had the partnership working on saving Central Park. Uh, and I, I truly believe that because I, I came to New York City in 1990 as the chief of the transit police. And that city was, I loved it, but it was a mess. And the subways were even worse. The subways were like going down to Dante's Inferno. The city, the city streets were like a Fellini movie. And then when you went below the ground, it was like Dante's Inferno. It was different. Then. One of the lively was that we depend on in New York is you. Thank God the Brits love coming over and shopping in our stores and taking advantage of the, uh, the bargains that we had. And I dare say when you come over that you feel safe. That, uh, and that was not the case in 1990. I didn't feel safe as the chief of the transit police. I never went anywhere without carrying a gun in New York City at that time because I felt that unsafe. Today, that gun is locked in a safe deposit box. I haven't thought about it in years because I feel that safe and I'm one of the most recognizable people in New York City. And, uh, but I feel safe walking the streets. Who's the only hand up here, sir? Well, thank you for your talk. Um, from, from your talk, I understood that the more number of police officers you have, the, uh, the shorter time it takes to uh, remove crime in the city. The, the New York is 38,000 to reduce crime in two years. LA is less than number of uh, police officers, but seven years. So in the case of British government, where uh, we can even read that there's going to be a reduction in the number of police uh, count. So in such a scenario, are you going to advise the government to reduce the number of police officers, or are you, are you going to say that we need more police officers? It's a great question because it's relevant to what's going on. The question is, if I understand, I'm, I'm high of hearing, so I apologize. Uh, the question, if I understand it, is the issue of the number of police. It is not so much, from my perspective, the number of police but how you use them and how you engage in partnerships, the force multipliers with other government agencies, with the community. By way of example, during that period of time in Boston when we reduced the department by 25% for the period of time as a result of a, a budget dispute between the mayor of Boston and the governor, that the crime situation does not increase significantly in Boston because of that awareness of the shortage of police, the public, worked with us in that time, they became the extra eyes and ears, if you will, because it was a recognition there were not as many police as they once had. In the city of Los Angeles, the number of police, the size of that city is huge, 480 square miles, 9,000 police officers, but at any given time in the city of Los Angeles, there might only be 500 police officers on duty. We used to see police cars so infrequently, those black and white police cars. My wife and I, Ricky, when we would travel around the city, if she saw one, she would say, Bill, look, a sighting. We <laughs> referred to them as a sighting because they were so rare to see a police car in the city of Los Angeles. So that it is not so much the issue of how many. Would I love to have a lot of them like I had in New York? You don't believe it, it makes it easier. But if you can't afford them, if you can't have them, that's where the challenge comes in, that's where leadership comes in, to take what you have, to use it most effectively. But in using it most effectively, what, are your, what is your intent as a police superintendent, chief constable, police commissioner, to listen to your public? What are their priorities? What is creating fear, disorder, crime in their neighborhoods? And what can we, the police, do about it 
what are our limitations, but as importantly, what can you do about it in terms of the partnership, the eyes and ears, or the other government agencies that are so important. What I saw in Manchester yesterday, if at the national level, the uh, entity that's responsible for probation, or the entity that's responsible for child services decides to pull their people out of that initiative in Manchester, the police are not going to be able to deal as effectively with the gang issue as they've begun to deal with them. The collaboration is essential. So it, again, it's not so much how many police you have, but how you use them. In New York City, prior to my appointment in 1994, <coughs> the department had begun to expand in size. But the police were not dealing with those broken windows, those quality of life. The squeegee pest, the individual who stood at an intersection, there was only about 12 ways to get onto the island of Manhattan in tunnels and bridges. And the squeegee pest was the most visible sign of that city out of control. Scruffy character would come up to your window and demand money for washing the window, or would pass for washing the window. And if not, there'd be an opportunity to have your car vandalized, to have them swear at you, and to just create a, an element of fear. We did a survey, and in Germany, there were only about 75 to 100 of them. They were great marketeers. They had the best spot in the city in terms of every day, hundreds of thousands of people were intimidated by them. 38,000 New York City police officers, 75 squeegee pests. Now, how long it took to get rid of them once the NYP decided to deal with them? A couple of days. <coughs> Could have taken a day, but it took a couple of days to get the message across because for 20 years, nobody had interfered with their behavior. You use police to control behavior to such an extent that you change it. What police were used for, beginning in my time in New York City, and where we used in Los Angeles, was to do what Sir Robert Peel intended them to do. By their presence, by their action, by their demeanor, to control the behavior of citizens in a society in which the expectation in return for public safety was that our behavior would be coordinated or controlled by our laws or our ordinances. And that if we did not obey them, it would be subject to interference by the police. Stop doing that. You don't stop doing it. I cite you. Citation doesn't work. I arrest you. The escalation of police powers. But what we were able to do in New York, and indeed a lot of us being focused now on in your country, is those things that were creating fear to use police behavior to change behavior. Not to break the law, not to use brutality, not to use slurs, but to do it in a democratic way. And that made the change over time. Okay. One more here directly in front of me, and then I'll go back down here. Uh, wait for the mic, please. Thanks. You spoke of the need for uh, police forces to collaborate with the rest of government. Uh, and at the same time, though, police may be called upon at times to investigate government. Uh, how do you balance the need for police autonomy and independence with the kind of collaboration that you call for? It's one of the challenges of our democracy, that they have this multiplicity of roles, that they are responsible to government in the sense of whether it be at the national level or now at the local level. At the same time, uh, they are also responsible for fair and impartial investigation potentially of that government. Robert Peel in his nine points uh, speaks to that, the nine principles, I should say. And let me just read to you that principle that speaks to that issue. By way of uh, explanation, uh, Robert Peel had his nine principles of policing. The young man who I interact with here from the uh, 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 <coughs> policy, uh, I'm having my senior moment, the policy has changed. <laughs> Uh, wrote a wonderful paper about uh, Robert Peel and these nine principles. He never actually wrote the nine principles. Actually, they were a combination of people looking at what all of his writings were and from that, these nine principles evolved. But there's one there that speaks to your issue, and it is, let me see if I can quickly find it. To seek and to preserve public favor, not by catering to public opinion, but by constantly demonstrating absolutely impartial service to all, in complete independence of policy, without regard to the justice or injustice of the substance of individual laws, by ready offering of individual service and friendship to all members of the public without regard to their wealth or social standing, 
by already offering up sacrifice and protecting and preserving life. To maintain a relationship at all times, a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historic tradition that the police are the public and that the public are the police. The police being only members of the public who are paid to give full time attention to duties which are incumbent on every citizen in the interest of community welfare in existence. And to recognize always the need for strict adherence to police executive functions and to refrain from even seeming to usurp the powers of the judiciary or avenging individuals of the state or authoritatively judging guilt and punishing the guilty. The principles really that were created in this country, in this city, speak to that understanding of the need for police to be impartial. That there will be times that they have to investigate those that they work for. To in a sense bifurcate that investigation to the opposite side. Not easy to do, but that is one of the obligations upon the police. So you have your hand up and back there. Just a timekeeper, how are we doing that? Well, it's up, I think another two or three, I think. Mean. Okay. Another one or two, right? Okay. Thank you. Uh, following the riots uh, in this country, we saw, we read a lot of uh, social explanations um, embedding problems in society and so on. You paint a more utopian vision that a leading a police commissioner with the right policies and strategies can change the uh, pattern of crime, reduce racial tensions, and improve society. Uh, surely that means that events like those riots where massive waves of crime break out reflect a failure of policing in, in the same way that a success in policing can reduce crime by, by 50, 60, 70 percent. And would you care to comment on what's happened in policing in this country that could have led to that kind of public unrest and failure of the rule of law? I can't speak with any informed uh, knowledge. Uh, my awareness of it is only through some of the media <coughs> that I read nothing at all in terms of what you'd be reading here in the country. I understand there are a number of reviews underway, uh, both internally within the police services as well as uh, at uh, different other levels, if you will. I think the school is also involved in a, uh, a relationship with uh, the Guardian newspaper to take a close look at that. I do know that in my country that uh, in terms of uh, riots that I have been uh, aware of, or more intimately uh, aware of, including in 1990 in uh, Crown Heights in New York City, and then in the riots in Los Angeles in 1992 that took 50 lives, that um, a significant uh, factor in those riots growing in my country with the fact that the police, in the case of New York City, uh, were inactive in the area of disturbance for the first 24 to 48 hours. Uh, and a report that was written, if I recall, basically uh, uh, blamed the leadership of the city for not uh, directing and authorizing the police to go in and deal with that disturbance. In the case of the Los Angeles Police Department, my own opinion is that in 1992, the Los Angeles Police Department, for the first time in its history, a very controlling police department because of their small numbers, that they were very much in control of neighborhoods, particularly minority neighborhoods, where they sought to exert their control with their small numbers. When they relinquished for the first time in their history a piece of the city, they literally withdrew from an intersection. It was that intersection in which, for seemingly an interminable time, a truck driver was being beaten on the ground by a group of gang members for the world to see, and the police were watching that and did not come to his assistance. That accelerated, in many respects, uh, that riot. So in terms of from each of these events, you seek to learn what not to do. In terms of in my country, and indeed my time in Los Angeles, that as I wrote about that, that, that city in 2002, and I just could not understand how the city that I was riding around in, that I was now responsible for, had gotten so out of control so quickly. And the lesson I learned at that time, the American experience, was that you don't see the ground, that basically has to the greatest ability possible to basically get in there and deal with it. In the case of the LAPD, that uh, our issue was that the shortage of personnel, because of the refusal to collaborate with the Sheriff's Department and other police agencies, that they were going to do it on their own. That was a lesson learned that plans to address any act of disturbance in that city now would very quickly bring in the Sheriff's Department, Highway Patrol, 
the surrounding 42 cities and towns that work there. The idea is to basically not see any ground get police in there as quickly as you can. Uh, we, we've learned a lot. I think in your country there will be a lot learned from what occurred in terms of improvements going forward. Out of crises, the term I use, out of crises comes opportunity and, and comes challenge. And certainly the events in your country are creating a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges that will need to be addressed going forward. One last question, Ms. Jelly, I've been very, very patient over here to the side. Yeah, I think I had a question about um, related to the fact that 70% of the rioters that ended up in front of the penal system were uh, people that had previous offenses. And it is often the case, actually, that the police know the perpetrators of new crime. And one of the things you haven't talked about uh, this evening is about you know, the penal system and uh, how soft or how hard it needs to be, or then what happens. You know when actually criminals get booked uh, as you used before to actually reinsert them in society when they get out. It's a great question. Let me come at it in two ways. The issue, I guess, has been reported in the press that something on the order of 12% of those arrested uh, in the riots for gang members, and something on, on the order of 75% who have been identified and arrested and previous criminal records. I would caution on reading too much into that initially, because let's face it, gang members because of the intense attention police face uh, focus on them, they're relatively small numbers, they are very well known by and large to the police. So the police I've been dealing with the last two days are very intimate in their areas, who's who. So these characters and some of the videos I've watched that you've watched that uh, oftentimes didn't even bother to cover their faces. So they were the easiest to identify initially. The second group that was easy to identify as you're pouring over all the videos that were taken from the thousands of cameras that you have in this country, were those who were there to match up with mugshots that you already possess. In other words, many of these people also were known to the police or were easily identified because of their criminal history and the images that we have. The third group, the first timers, if you will, who were taking advantage of the situation, probably harder to identify because their faces are not in the mug books of the police or they may not be as well known to neighborhood store owners, et cetera, who can look at a video and say, yeah, that's Johnny Jones, he was arrested a few months ago, he just got out of jail, versus this person took the bus in from someplace else to go and enjoy the looting. They're never going to identify because nobody in the neighborhood knows who they are. So I'd be cautious about drawing too much out of that early on uh, as it relates to that. The other issue, uh, the second part of your question, about <coughs> the importance of community policing, the importance of what I've been seeing in the briefings I've been having so far, and I'm sure we'll be echoed in Birmingham tomorrow. The focus of what the police are attempting to do is to prevent crime. That was the big mistake of the 70s and 80s. We were focusing on crime that had already occurred. We improved our rapid response to it. We improved our forensic capabilities to investigate it. We improved our ability to get convictions. There's nobody in this room that would prefer it to not be the victim of crime than to basically take satisfaction that the perpetrator that committed the crime against you was arrested. So the focus that we returned to in the 1990s was Sir Robert Peel's focus, that police exist to prevent crime. And in New York City, if you think of it, and I'll use this as an example, in that city of 8 million people, 2,242 murders in 1990. This year, in the city of New York, they'll have approximately, I'll use the figure, 400. So approximately 1,800 fewer, largely young black males or Hispanic males. 80% of the murders in New York, New York City, are committed by blacks, the vast majority of victims of blacks. The Latino population accounts for roughly most of the rest. The safest person in New York City is me, a white male in his 50s or 60s. That we have very little cross-racial crime. So much of the crime is in the poor neighborhoods, in our minority communities. And that this year, those 400 murders, that means that there are approximately 1,600 young minority males who are going to live and hopefully live in a way that their lives will be productive. But also, because we have a, an arrest rate of 80 to 90% for murders in my country and some of the major cities, 
That's another 12 to 1,400 young men who would be arrested for those murders, convicted, and spend the next 25 years of their life in jail. And then when they get out, we probably get back to crime again because they have no other way of making a living. So the more we focus on prevention, keeping those young men and women from being murdered, and those young men and women from murdering them and going to jail for the rest of their life, that's the success, that's the investment that needs to be made, the economic investment. And one other figure I'll throw at you, the Rand Corporation did a study involving, uh, among other cities, Los Angeles, about the economic impact of crime. And this study, and the two others have done about the same time, and the Rand study was the most conservative, indicated that the death by homicide of one individual in the city of Los Angeles had a negative economic impact of $4 million on the economy of Los Angeles. This year in Los Angeles, there will have fewer than 300 murders. In, when I went in in, 19, in 2002, they had 676. So let's say close to 400 fewer murders, $4 million times 400, $1.6 billion positive economic impact on the city. The police budget was $1.3 billion. I was giving the city a great rate of return on their investment, <laughs> just in the murder category. I'm not being facetious about that. That the idea of public safety remains one of the first obligations of government to invest in, because the benefits that accrue to it are phenomenal if that investment is, in fact, used wisely. And I think the effort that you're about to engage in is your government's effort to try a different approach to use the scarce resources that are available to use them more wisely. Uh, it remains to be seen that uh, you stay tuned, if you will, as it goes forward. But uh, there, there are some very interesting uh, times ahead uh, on this issue, both here in your country and certainly in my country as we west wrestle with the issues. But the good news is, best of times, we learned a lot in the 1990s as a result of the errors of the 1970s and 80s. And we're going forward in a more informed way I would not want to be going into this recession and continuing if we were still repeating the mistakes of the 70s and 80s. I'm more confident of the fact of all that we learned in the 1990s. Thank you so much for your attention.
So I'd just like to thank Bill Bratton enormously for engaging with us this evening, both speaking and then answering the questions, and invite me once again to thank him for his time. Hope the rest of you are